So thank you very much, Matt. Thanks for the invitation to be here today, and thank you for showing up. Uh, and for giving me the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about uh, our maybe somewhat unexpected <coughs> connection between things that happen in the living biological world and things that happen in the world of man-made machines. In particular, I'm interested in big machines, such as the one we're building in London, uh, big particle accelerators. Uh, and let me start by reminding you of uh, the fact that actually uh, there are countless examples of um, systems in which man is inspired by nature. As you try to solve some kind of practical, sometimes technological problem by uh, imitating, by uh, looking for some solution that Mother Nature developed over millions of years of evolution uh, to some other problem in another arena. And uh, this is uh, so, this happens so often that even if it has a name, it's biomimetics, this whole field of knowledge that searches for these connections between the living world and the inanimate world. And this is just one example of it. This plant that I'm showing here, this bush, it's called a burdock bush. It's actually very common all over Europe, and in particular in the Alps. And this plant has developed a very uh, ingenious way of propagating itself, uh, allowing its seed to uh, go over very large areas. And that way involves the receptacle that contains its seeds, which is right here. So its seeds are contained by burrs that look like this. And what's special about these burrs is that they will fasten very easily to anything which is furry, such as an animal going on. And this makes it very easy for these birds to go over a much larger area uh, and therefore uh, distribute these seeds and allow the plants to multiply. Um, I'm sure that Mother Nature took a long time to solve that problem, and the way in which it did it, the mechanism behind the stickiness of the burrs of this plant to animals first, is that these burrs actually have a zillion little hooks that very easily entangle with anything that looks like a small thread. And, and this has worked very well. And in fact, uh, it was by looking at these uh, plants that uh, a French or a Swiss uh, uh, engineer called Georges de Vestal, uh, sometime in the late 40s, while hiking along the Alps with his dog, realized that these things were getting connected to his pants and his dog's fur, and he looked closer. And this is how he invented Velcro, which some of you might be familiar with. Uh, so Velcro is actually also consists of two layers, right? Two, two pieces that get connect, connected together. Uh, the upper piece here is made up of a zillion tiny little threads, like velvet or velour in French, whereas the under part is made up of a zillion little hooks, or crochet, or hook in French. And this is how uh, you get the stickiness property of Velcro. So uh, following exactly the same type of solution that was uh, used uh, by nature in connecting those plants to animal fur. Now, the, the kind of connection between living things and inanimate things that I want to talk to you about today is of a different kind. In this case, we're looking at nature and trying to make use of a solution to solve one of our problems. So the analogy brings us to something which is good for us. Uh, the case I want to talk to you about and the connection between the lives of insects and the lives of electrons inside a big accelerator actually leads to a type of behavior that we desperately want to avoid. We do not want that the electrons behave like beetles. We want to prevent them from doing that. Uh, but it's nevertheless very interesting to note that there is some kind of underlying theme uh, in the mathematical modeling uh, that you can make of all of these systems that connect in some in sometimes unexpected ways two subjects which are so far apart in entomology and uh, particle accelerator physics. And it's this kind of underlying thing that I would like to, to talk to you about. Okay, the particular life form that uh, I have chosen for this uh, talk is fireflies. Now these are insects um, uh, that belong to a family called Coleoptera, so uh, in simpler terms they are beetles. And, um, these are winged insects, actually only the males can fly. Interesting thing to, to note. Uh, most of the uh, uh, um, species uh, of, that, of those insects 
And they have a part of their life which is larval. So they, they, they live as larvae on the ground. They're not flying. They don't have any wings yet. And that's the part that takes most of their lives. They can be in that phase for months, sometimes years. And then in spring, all of a sudden they emerge for a life that takes one or two weeks. And during those two weeks of adult life, their only purpose in life is find a mate and eat and die. Uh, so after a long wait, I can, I can understand their situation. Uh, they are, uh, mainly they exist in humid areas, so in Southeast Asia, in Brazil, and other places. I have seen some reports on the web that they exist in, in uh, Sweden as well, but I have not seen them myself. Probably you know better if they... Yes, I see some, some, someone who has seen them in Sweden as well. Uh, and of course, the, the important thing about those animals is that they uh, exhibit bioluminescence. That is, they can blink, they can shine. And the mechanism through which they do that is a chemical reaction based on this uh, proton of sprays. And it's interesting to note that it's a very, very effective uh, reaction. So it produces a lot of light without producing a lot of heat. A lot of heat. So it's quite milieu on uh, um, Yeah, so. Uh, of course, the natural question that a biologist would ask himself or herself is, why do they do it? What's, what's in it? Why do a, does an insect need to shine or to blink? Uh, what does it gain from it? And I'm no entomologist, so I cannot really give you an answer to that question. But I can tell you what I have found on the web and on Wikipedia and things like that. So you can all, can all find the same way that I did. Um, and I think there's a lot of controversy. There's still some discussions on what the real reasons are. But in the end, it all boils down to, as is often the case in the animal world, and I think also in the human world, it boils down to power, food, and sex. So there are three things that people typically claim to be uh, the reason for them to blink. Uh, the first one is uh, power. So making sure that your predators do not get you. You want to scare them away. You want to show that you are powerful and that they will not eat you. Uh, then a second possible uh, explanation is that you want to attract prey. So you want to look so shiny and interesting that prey will come to you and eat them up. And the, and the final explanation, which only serves for that brief period of two weeks in which they are trying to find a mate, is to attract a partner to them. Uh, it's also interesting to note that every species of firefly has its own blinking period, its own emission spectrum. So it's it emits that particular type of light of that species, so they can recognize each other. So they, they, they won't be fussing around with somebody else's insect. Okay. Uh, now, that's all very fine, and that's all about the animal world, and okay, it's curious, and it's nice to know about it. Uh, but things start getting really interesting, at least from my perspective, when they start exhibiting something called collective behavior. So now you're no longer thinking about just a single firefly blinking its way away and trying to find a mate. But there are instances in which many of those fireflies start blinking together. And when I talk about many, it's really, really many. Uh, it's, there are some 2,000 species of those animals in the world, and a very small fraction, about 1 to 2 percent, has been observed to exhibit the synchronized blinking behavior. Uh, over pretty large areas. And when I say large areas, I'm talking about kilometers. I'm talking about uh, many thousands of animals blinking together. So you can imagine this big cloud of fireflies extending over several kilometers, and the firefly on that end of the cloud has no connection to the firefly on the other end, and still they are blinking together in synchronous. So of course this raises many interesting questions, both biological and non-biological in nature. Uh, there's one particular species which is most notable for this behavior, which is uh, uh, found in Thailand and has this unpronounceable name. And I'll just show you a uh, picture so you can connect to what I'm talking about. Okay, I'm going to show you now a uh, YouTube video so you can easily find it, which probably doesn't do justice to seeing this thing in the out in the open here. Yeah, it doesn't really do just justice. Um, but uh, you have to believe me when I tell you that one can make, almost make out by looking on a computer screen the trees which are in which the, all of these fireflies are. And the fact that they actually blend together is pretty much uh, uh, observable in this, in this view. Okay, uh, 
this all this stuff about synchronized blinking, synchronized flashing of fireflies, has been around for quite a long time. There have been reports for many, many years. Uh, all the way down to the 18th century, I think the, the first written report that I could find, again, on things such as Wikipedia and, this, and this such stuff, so don't believe it too much, but it's anyway what I could find. Um, and, uh, and there have been many accounts ever since. There's one particular account which I'm particularly fond of, first because it comes from my home country in Brazil, um, and second because it uses a kind of scientific language that I find hard to find in today's papers. It, it really looks more poetic in nature, and I really like the way this guy described it. An observation in the early 20th century, 1931, in the city of Petropolis. Uh, for those of you who don't know it, Petropolis is a place not far away from Rio, but it's up in the mountains. So this is where Pedro I and Pedro II, the two Brazilian emperors, used to spend their uh, holidays uh, flying away from the <coughs> terrible heat down on the beach. Um, and uh, in, in, those, in, in that place, so they found that they noted how hundreds of green lights blazed out simultaneously and were simultaneously exchanged with so regular a rhythm that it seemed as though the sparks blown upon by a huge mechanical belt that gave a puff every second. So it must really have been quite a sight to see this in the uh, mountains uh, around Rio. Uh, ever since, uh, even despite those many reports, it's also curious to see that the scientific community met these reports with extreme skepticism. And in fact, there are papers published showing exactly how all of this would be just some kind of optical illusion. So all of the reports were dismissed as either plain frauds, just people trying to fool you, or as some failure on part of the observer. There was something wrong with the observation. This cannot be true. And while well, you have just have seen, now YouTube shows it spiritually, it must be true, right? <laughs> uh, but ever since, there have been a lot of quantitative uh, observations as well. And these quantitative observations uh, led to several uh, <coughs> um, of, uh, facts. Uh, first is that they will indeed, these fireflies will be synchronized uh, to their own beat frequency, so by themselves, nothing else is leading them to that. Uh, they can even synchronize to an external pulse source, so you can, you can actually make them blink to your phase. You've got to blink together close to their own frequency, but they, you, you can make them follow you. And that's, that's funny. Uh, and finally, as I mentioned before, it's really thousands of individuals that uh, blink together, and the synchronization level is down to the millisecond. This has been measured. Uh, a lot of what we know about these animals are coming from these two <coughs> American, North American biologists, um, John and uh, Elizabeth Buck. Uh, this guy started working on this in his undergraduate studies in the 30s and went all his life studying them up until the 80s. And uh, apparently he met his wife while doing this. So that's when he ceased being a solitary researcher and uh, took her with him in all of his uh, trips. And here you see the kind of experiment, controlled experiment he, he tried to perform, in which he goes to a dark room, he captures some of these fireflies, brings them in, let them shine, and this is where he did experiments such as let me blink and make you blink the way I want you to blink. And, uh, and that actually uh, was observed in, in there's loads of publications on this um, uh, along the years. Now, that's all very fine. Um, what the hell does this have to do with accelerators? Uh, and, of course, the uh, key to the answer to that question lies in the mathematical modeling that can be made of those systems. We can understand those, that kind of collective behavior in manners that in, in many ways resemble uh, the behavior of electrons in, in a circular accelerator. In fact, there is, uh, I will show you just one example of uh, uh, scientific work published in this case in the early 90s by a, a mathematician called Stephen uh, Strogatz. By the way, there's plenty of material by this guy in YouTube. Uh, it's really fun, so <laughs> if you want to, to know more about animals behaving together. He has a lot of interesting stuff. Um, and uh, just so you don't think this is old stuff, uh, the latest one I have seen published on this topic, this very same topic dates, it's a, a physical review X from last Friday, where there seems to have been a big breakthrough in the mathematical modeling behind these, these systems. Uh, but what did this guy do in the early 90s? Well, he came up with a, a description of fireflies, which basically follows some kind of mathematical <coughs> in which each firefly is seen as an oscillator. 
And these oscillators, they are, of course, they are special oscillators because they blink, no blink, blink, no blink. It's kind of more a square wave than a sine wave, but they are oscillators. And these oscillators are coupled together. They interact because one firefly sees the other firefly. And it's this interaction that leads, in the end, to the synchronization. But the nice thing is that he could model it uh, mathematically and come to the conclusion that if each one of the fireflies has a certain natural oscillation frequency, it tends to blink at a certain rhythm. And not all fireflies blink exactly at the same rhythm. They have a small variation amongst them. Uh, the larger this variation is, the harder it is to get them all in sync. So what his mathematical modeling told us was that there was some kind of coupling parameter k which had a threshold behavior. That is, when k is above a certain limit, then there is enough interaction between the fireflies, amongst all the fireflies, to cause the synchronized behavior. If the k value, if the coupling constant is too low, then there's not enough and they remain incoherent. Uh, and the nice thing is that this coupling parameter, the threshold over which you need to be to make them couple and blink all together, is uh, smaller. The smaller is the difference between the natural oscillation frequencies of those uh, fireflies. Fine. So now, so that's what I just said. The, the special and then above the special synchronization merges. So you need enough um, coupling, enough interaction between the fireflies to make them blink together. Uh, now, to make the jump to see how this model applies to an accelerator, I have to say a few words. Now I think I see a lot of people from Max 4, so you have to close your ears for the next two minutes. Uh, where I say something about this big accelerator that we're all involved in and we're all very excited about, and which is being built here up in Brunswick. And that's Max 4. So inside Max 4, this is a complex of electron accelerators. And it has basically a big, long, linear accelerator, 300 meters long, where uh, electrons are accelerated up to 3 giga electron volts. And once they reach the end of that linear accelerator, they are brought inside what we call a circle accelerator. Now, this is about 500 meters in circumference. And we keep the electrons that were brought in, these very high energy electrons, going round and round and round for many, many hours. As they do that, they go through some special types of magnets called insertion devices. And when they do that, the, their trajectory is made to bounce sideways. So they go back and forth sideways. And by doing that, they emit a lot of synchrotron radiation, as we call it, a lot of light. And the interest of producing that light is that then you can make it inside upon a variety of material samples and study and understand the behavior of those samples at the atomic and molecular level. So basically, you'll be shining light on stuff, looking at what comes out of that interaction. And from those results, you figure out how atoms are organized, how they are connected together, and so on and so forth. OK. So to make these accelerators run, we need a lot of uh, electrons, and a lot of electrons which are accelerated. And we need to make them go round and round for a long time in this big circular uh, storage ring, as we call it. Fine. Uh, this is a picture of what this will all look like in 2016 when this uh, facility is inaugurated. So if I'm not wrong, this is the E22, right? If I'm wrong, please somebody correct me before I make a fool of myself. Um, and this is a picture of what it all looked like uh, if you haven't been there recently in late December last year. So you see that it starts getting similar to what it's actually going to be. Uh, this is kind of a close-up on that region. So this, this donut-shaped building here. This is the one that houses that big storage range, 500 meters in circumference that I've just shown you. OK. Now, back to accelerators then. Now you know everything about accelerators, at least everything you need to know to understand this lecture. Uh, and uh, as I said, just like the fireflies can be seen as things that tend to blink at a certain rhythm, electrons, each one of the individual electrons which are stored in the storage ring, can be seen as oscillators as things that are going back and forth, that are oscillating in uh, all three degrees of freedom. Uh, it's interesting to note that actually here there are many more. I mean, I talked to you about maybe thousands of fireflies. Here we're talking about 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9, or 10 to the 10 electrons. So it's, it's a big swarm of electrons that we have inside the chain. Um, and again, uh, what you want these electrons to do is to go round and round and round for many, many hours, so many zillions of turns in that machine and still be kept stable. You don't want them to go wandering around. They should be all close to what we call the nominal electron. 
the, the one which is following the orbit that we designed for the machine. None of them actually follows that, but they should, should all be very close to it. And you want to make sure that the deviations with respect to that nominal design orbit is, are as small as possible. And you also want to guarantee that this is happening even when the electrons start interacting in the same way as the fireflies are interacting through their flashing. Uh, so here again, the key to guaranteeing stability is to avoid the indefinite growth of the motion of the center of mass of that blob of electrons by adding incoherence, by adding a spread in the frequencies, or a spread in the rhythms of each, and just as a spread in the rhythms of each individual firefly prevents them from blinking synchronously. So here you want to make sure that the electrons do not blink synchronously. And uh, I will try just to illustrate that with a couple of animations. So here I show you two plots in which I have drawn uh, a cloud or a swarm of electrons. So each little red dot in this uh, circle, or in this disk, represents an electron. Uh, the horizontal axis indicates something proportional to the position of that electron, the position with respect to some nominal electron, which happens to be at the center, at x equals zero. The vertical coordinate in this plot represents something like the speed, the velocity of the electron, or you could think of it as the angle that the that electron makes with the nominal direction of motion. So what you want all electrons to be to do is to keep nicely and stably making circles around that central position. You don't want them to wander around and maybe at some point even get lost and hit the wall of the vacuum chamber in which they are circulating. Um, I have also done something special to this plot in which I have prepared the initial conditions to observe the motion of this blob in time uh, by giving a kick to it. So you may notice that the center of mass of this disk is actually shifted along the vertical axis. It's not at zero. Right? It's just like I'm taking this blob of electron, giving it a kick, and watching how it's going to oscillate uh, afterwards. Now I have on the left-hand side exactly the same initial conditions I have on the right-hand side. But the difference from this one to this one is that here, each and every single red dot is blinking exactly at the same frequency. So all fireflies there, they have exactly the same blinking rhythm. Whereas here, my fireflies have each one of them a slightly different blinking rhythm. And let's see what happens when we watch what they will do over time. So on the left hand side, what you see, where I have marked one electron blue, I have painted one of our fireflies in blue, so that we can follow its motion amongst all of these zillions of other little dots. And you see that a long time, the, that single electron goes nicely. It's not perturbed at all. It has a fixed amplitude of oscillation. Its frequency doesn't change either. And the whole bunch also moves coherently. The whole thing is also moving all the time. Nothing is happening to that center of mass motion. It's still going <coughs> un without any perturbation. Now, if I turn on some frequency spread, this is what happens. Now they start getting out of sync. Now, after a little while, that individual electron is still blinking at ex exactly at the same frequency. Each one of the individual red dots is still doing the same thing, but the ensemble is doing nothing. So now the center of this blob just happens to be, seems to be stationary. It's not moving at all. So if you're just looking from, from far away, you don't see anything. So the mere fact that there is a little spread in, the, in this uh, um, intrinsic uh, blinking rhythm of each firefly makes it so that they, in time, lose coherence. And that's the fundamental key to making sure that uh, this kind of motion will not start growing indefinitely through the interactions with the vacuum chamber and lead to a loss of heat. So that's kind of the trick we want to play in a beam such as the Max 4 beam inside our uh, electron storage rate. Now the question then is, how do you create that spread in frequencies? How do you make sure that each one of the fireflies has a slightly different rhythm? How do you produce those different rhythms? There are many ways to do that. I will not talk about uh, uh, all of these ways. I'll just mention that one of these ways 
involves the idea that every oscillator has two properties. It has a frequency, it has a rhythm, and it has a certain amplitude by how much it swings back and forth. So if you can create in some way a dependence of the rhythm on the amplitude so that particles with different amplitude have different oscillation rhythms, then since there will always be particles with different amplitudes inside that bunch, you see that our particles close to the origin, particles <coughs> far away from the origin, then you naturally also have a spread in frequencies. So the trick we want to play is we want to increase uh, or generate this uh, uh, spread in frequencies uh, by exploring a dependence of the frequency on the amplitude. Okay, how do you do that? I will just look at one uh, uh, way of, uh, of uh, thinking about it, which is what we call longitudinal motion in, in a particle accelerator. And this is motion which is governed, which is determined by the electromagnetic fields which are stored in big objects like this. This is an RF radio frequency cavity, where energy in the form of radio frequency waves at 100 megahertz are stored in the form of standing waves. And these are the waves that give energy to the electrons give them back the energy they lose when they emit synchrotron radiation. And you can think of uh, the effect of such a device, we have six of those in, in the next four 3G ring, as a, like of creating a, a well, a well in which our electrons are bouncing back and forth. It's just like a cup. So if you imagine each electron as a, as a little a ball, and you imagine that uh, these devices, they provide a kind of cup in which these electrons can bounce back and forth, back and forth stably. So this, the shape of this potential well, as we like to call it in, in physics, is determined by the properties of the fields inside those resonating objects. And here I have painted, again, I like to paint electrons, so I have painted one red and one blue, and the red electron is an electron which is oscillating with large swings, so it's going back and forth with a large amplitude. Uh, whereas the blue electron, the amplitude happens to be 0.4 in those units I have chosen here. And the, this electron, the blue one, is oscillating just with 0.25. So it's almost half the amplitude of the large amplitude electron. Now, if I go through the tricks of solving all of the equations, blah, 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 uh, what I find out when I follow what happens to this, these electrons over time is this. They are nicely bouncing back and forth, back and forth. and if you count, if you're patient enough to count how they're doing this, you will notice that over the first oscillation period, they were nearly in sync. So when the, when the red one went once and came back, the blue one had also gone once and come back. The second almost the same. But now pay attention a bit more. You see that there's a slight difference. So that's the first, that's the second, and that's the third. And look at the fourth now. Yeah. Now this guy has already reached the maximum position, right? It's about to come back, to bounce back to the origin again. Whereas this guy has not reached the point for it. So this guy is going a little bit slower than this guy. If this is going a little bit slower, this means its natural rhythm of blinking is a little bit slower than this guy. So this kind of potential, this kind of uh, restoring force that keeps the electrons safely circulating around the origin, already by itself generates some spread in that blinking frequency. Because electrons at high amplitudes have a slightly longer period, which means a slightly lower frequency than the electron at a lower amplitude. Uh, but the point is, this is not enough. So we have this for free. If you just use, we don't do anything else, we have this for free. But the problem is this is not enough. If you really want to guarantee stability of high currents, you need more spread than this. And this we do by introducing these elements. So these are called harmonic cavities. That's, again, a resonating object, big uh, copper uh, 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 box, in which we store electromagnetic energy in the form of standing waves. But these have different frequencies compared to the, the ones I showed before. These are third harmonic. They operate at three times the frequency of the main carrier, so at 300 megahertz. And what happens to that potential well, to the little cup that's holding our electrons, if we move from one case to the other, whoops, is this, as it suddenly becomes like this. And what's so nice about it? Well, 
what's nice about it is that now, if I do the same experiment as I had before, things start looking very different. Now I have again my green, my red and blue electrons, and they are again oscillating stably in that potential well. But now if you start counting, you see the things have changed. The red electron is actually going faster, and the blue electron is going slower. And it's going, and the difference in the time it takes for each one of them to complete one cycle is much, much larger than the difference between those two I showed you before. So this means that the difference in natural blinking rhythms of these two fireflies is now much, much larger than it was before. Which means that we need a lot more coupling between them to generate synchronicity and to generate the unwanted blinking of all electrons together. So this is a situation that makes our beam much more stable, even at high currents at maximum, than uh, the other situation I showed you before. Uh, and this is the connection that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, I would like to just uh, finish this by showing you uh, one more um, YouTube uh, film. Uh, so there's plenty of YouTube these days. Um, and that one is just to highlight something which is not highlighted in my own animations, which is the fact that to make them blink together, they have to interact, right? If you keep a firefly hidden in a box, it doesn't see the other fireflies, it will not blink together with another firefly in another room. They have to interact. So one electron has to see the other electron for them to uh, uh, blink together. And it's just this interaction that we try to minimize. Uh, and this is a, a, a YouTube video where it's clearly demonstrated how this how interaction is needed. Maybe it's familiar to some of you. Uh, and in this case, the fireflies become metronomes. And everything starts with metronomes being totally uh, uh, incoherently excited. So they have totally different phases. Each one is going one way. They have nothing to do with each other. And they keep like that as long as there's no interaction. Then as long as you put this thing on top of these two uh, covacans and they can interact through the motion of the, of, of the base plate, now watch what happens. And in a quick while, you'll see that they all be going together. And all by themselves. You, you, don't, you don't have to do anything. And that's exactly what we don't want the electrons in Max 4 to do. <laughs> There's even a nice thing, the guy will take out, and they will be here again. So you need to keep the interaction. The interaction is the key. So that's why the impedance has to be small in, in, in the accelerator. small differences in frequencies that anyhow exist between the metronomes to decohere them. If we have sound, it's nice because then you can, you can follow the rhythm in your, with your ears, which is even... There, there you see there, totally. Okay, so uh, that's what I have to say. So, can they behave like Beatles? Yes, but we don't want them to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.